Good morning. I'll also say good afternoon or good evening because those who are online, some are watching live now and others will watch at another time. And uh, this is the last week of our series, My Table. And when we refer to My Table, we're speaking about God's table, that He has a table and He invites people to come to that table. And the focus today is really how that table is both very personal and also portable. And when we speak of table, we're really talking about relationship uh, with God and one another. And the value of being those who are together with him, uh, both personally and, and in a portable way. Uh, so often um, people think of God as an ideal or a concept, a principle, a phenomenon, rather than a person to be known and experienced personally. So I really enjoyed this morning as we were worshiping, the songs we were singing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. You know, the, the prayer of that song is that we would find ourselves together with God at his table and our eyes being open, not just the eyes in our head, but the eyes in our heart. With the eyes in your head, you can only see the people who, like you can in this room or wherever you are, maybe you're sitting at a table now, you can see those people, but when the eyes of your heart are open, you can actually see Jesus at the table with you. And the moment you see Jesus at the table, not just the people you can see with your eyes, but the one you can see with the eyes of your heart, that table becomes something different for you. That table is now life-changing. And I know that personally um, from many moments at table after table after table, sometimes being at the table and not recognizing that he was present, having come and gone away. And yes, there was some benefit, but when I'm conscious aware that he's present at the table when when something in the eyes of my heart are opened and I realize he's present that's a game changer uh, it, it's a different dynamic and so this is really important but it's A.W. Tozer in his book and and one of my tables uh, a group that I meet with on Fridays we're reading his book called the pursuit of God I recommend it to everybody uh, it was written by him in 1948 and he talks about these notions about God, God being an ideal, God being a concept, a phenomenon, God being this law, something not personal, something impersonal. And he says these notions about God are many and varied, but those who hold them have one thing in common. They do not know God in personal experience. Uh, he goes on to say the, pers the possibility of intimate acquaintance has not entered their minds. Um, that may sound foreign or strange to some of us, but it's true. Uh, for so many people, the possibility of intimate acquaintance with God, to know him personally, it never really enters their mind. Um, he says, while admitting his existence, meaning God's existence, they do not think of him as knowable in the sense that we know things or people. How about you? Do you think of God as knowable? Do you think of being able to have a personal experience with him? He goes on, and I thought this was really important. He says, Christians, to be sure, go further than this, at least in theory. Their creed requires them to believe in the personality of God, and they have been taught to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. But for millions of Christians, nevertheless, God is no more real than he is to the non-Christian. I thought, man, he wrote this in 1948, that for millions of Christians, God, for Christians now, this, this to me, is not something I would expect to be written. <laughs> For millions of Christians, God is no more real to them than he is to non-Christians. They go through their life trying to love an ideal and be loyal to a mere principle. I thought about that. I thought, you know, people think of marriage as an ideal. It is. Marriage is a concept. Marriage is a phenomenon. But for those of us who are married, you realize you're not married to an ideal or a concept or a phenomena. You are married to a person. And marriage is intensely personal. And it's also portable because you remain married even if you two happen to be 
on different continents at some point because of travel on the part of one of you. But for many, he's saying, it's not personal, it's impersonal. The last thing I'll read that he said is, quote, over against all this cloudy vagueness stands the clear scriptural doctrine that God can be known in personal experience. Praise God. A loving personality dominates the Bible. Walking among the trees of the garden, as uh, Elder Chris spoke about this morning. Walking among the trees of the garden and breathing fragrance over every scene. Always a living person is present, speaking, pleading, loving, working, and manifesting himself whenever and wherever his people have the receptivity necessary to receive the manifestation. Amen? This is really good. And for those who are watching, listening, or present, like, yeah, I, I think of God in terms of having personal experience. Just understand that we live in a culture where many Christians and non-Christians alike, that is not their experience. And so when you engage with people and they say, I'm a Christian, you can't really assume what that means. Um, we, we can't just go, okay, that, it means what I think it means. Because we know that words, vocabulary have different meanings for different people depending on what it imports to you. So that's Tozer, but let's go early and look at Paul um, of Tarsus, who is a follower of Jesus, was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write much of what we have in the Bible today, particularly the New Testament. And Paul says this in Acts chapter 17, verses 28 through 29. He says, For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own po uh, poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Paul is writing uh, in, in his book here, um, expressing this. Uh, the book is written by Luke, who is recording what Paul said. It's probably the better way to say it. We know that uh, Luke is the author of Acts, but he's quoting Paul. Um, Paul was in, I believe, Athens at the point, and he had been observing all of these monuments and physical things that were built, and they were really I idols. And uh, he saw one that was, uh, the inscription said, to an unknown God, and he said, that which you worship in ignorance, let me help you to know who the true God is. So he was speaking to a culture that had a concept of God, had an ideal about God, had even made objects representing God, but he's trying to say, you, we should not think of God in this way. He said, even your own poets, referring to the Cretans, have said, we, referring to God, well, referring to us, we are God's offspring. That's intensely personal language when you speak about offspring. Ask any mama about her offspring, her child, her baby. Ask any parent, any father. If we are God's offspring, that's intensely personal. But he went on, to, he said at first, he said, we, he said we, so this is collective, it's not just you individually. He says, in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Our being actually derives from God. So since our being derives from God, how could his being be less than ours? Um, our highest and best thoughts about God um, still come short of his being, come short of, of uh, he created us. And this maybe takes us on to Moses, who says these words, and I'll just give it to you. Then, he says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. This is so important. You know, when, when Moses uh, was writing Genesis and he was speaking about creation, he comes to this part where he talks about man, male and female, being made in the very image and the likeness of God. This supports and undergirds exactly what Paul was saying about in him we live and move and we have our being and, and, and we, we, our being is derived from his. Tozer says this in his book, but it's in the Bible, in Hebrews. It speaks clearly that we understand by faith that the world was framed by the word of God, 
the world in which we live was actually created, came into being, came into existence by God speaking it. It didn't exist before he spoke, but he existed from eternity before that which is temporal, this table, the chair, the floor, the building, the metro. All of those things are real to us and our senses perceive them. We see the train. We hear the chime close as you rush on the platform to jump on, trying not to get stuck. We, we, we feel the heat of the sun. We taste some good fruit. Our senses communicate the reality of the world in which we live. Yet the Bible makes clear that that which is seen was actually made from that which is unseen. Unseen does not mean real. When we speak about the unseen world, we're talking about the unseen reality of God. The unseen, invisible reality of God is what created the visible world. But we're so attuned to what we perceive through our senses, through taste and touch and, and, and hearing and sight, that we can almost be clueless to the invisible reality that is eternally present and is as close as your breath. But because we don't, uh, we don't communicate with it with these natural senses in the same way, we think it's not real. But this, which we call real, is fading away. That's why you buy a new pair of shoes. But that which is eternal never fades, it never corrodes, it never wears out. And it exists by God speaking it, and he upholds it continuously. That world is equally, in fact, more real than the one in which we live. I don't know if it's fair to say more real because God created, but I know the one that we can taste, touch, and feel is fading, and the one that created it from which he lives, where angels and all these beings are that we don't see with our eyes, it's so real. And so we say, God, open the eyes of my heart so that we can see you, the invisible God. Even if it doesn't result in seeing him with our naked eyes, his presence is just as real and communicates to our spirit more than this table which is fading. And this is important because that is a necessary ingredient to live by faith. So where does all this take us? We talked a little bit about what Tozer said. We talked a little bit about what Paul said, a little bit about what Moses said. But let's look at Jesus himself. In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, I want you to see the creation of this table. Jesus went up on a mountainside. And called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. And to have authority to drive out demons. Mark wrote this. It's significant. It's worthy of us giving our attention to it. Jesus. Just the first word there. If you read what's happening before, he is growing um, in terms of being known publicly. He, he is having personal encounters with people, and most of them go away different than before they met him. He's healing people who are sick. He is raising people who have died physically, raising them back to life. And that's a great way to end a funeral. That's a great way to end a funeral. Get up. He's providing for people who are at their end and have no hope and don't know where they're going to go. This is what he's doing as he's encountering people. He's helping people who are in place of despair, hopelessness. He's helping people who are full of greed, full of themselves, angry. 
But in this moment, he goes up into a mountain. We know he had spent the night in prayer, and he actually calls to himself, they call it the Twelve, the first disciples. He calls them, and they came to him. This relationship that he's inviting them into, they didn't choose him. He chose them. It's important to note that because in the time that Mark is writing about, those who were teachers or rabbis, um, their students actually chose them. So it really makes a point that Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. He actually chose Simon Peter. He chose Andrew, his brother. He chose James, John, Thaddeus. He chose all of them. Judas, Scary. He chose them. And this is why he chose them. He says, he appointed 12 that they might be with him. It doesn't, the first thing that is said there, the reason, he says, he appointed them that they might be with him. I remember being probably 20 years of age, maybe 21, reading this verse. I was in the stacks, the library at Howard University. H-U. If you say H-U and you hear people say you know, they went to Howard. That is, that is their mantra. I was at Howard. I was in the stacks. Um, some of us in this room, Pastor Wendy Ward, my wife, Pastor Marianne, probably some others. We, we were students. We were single. Uh, we were in relationship with God. We felt called to be on the campus, so we'd be on the campus preaching. Um, sometimes our leaders would have us stand on the campus and just say, preach. Give us a verse and say, preach this. That was our training. I'm thankful for ENLI, Leadership 215, take the course, go for it. I just want to tell you, we got thrown out there and it's like, stand up and preach. I don't know what to say. Read this scripture, pray, trust God, preach. And two minutes later, you were done. You said, oh, that, that was your whole revelation for that day. <laughs> then we'd go witnessing on the campus in groups of twos. Young men I would engage. Hey, man, what's your name? And make friends. Some of them didn't want to hear what I had to say. Some of them thought, man, that's where I am right now. But that's what we were doing. And, and then our group would come back together and we would talk about how, to, how it went. Someone got born again and you invited them to the meeting that was happening later, that day or that week, or you invited them to a Sunday service. You started discipling them, helping them follow Jesus the way you were learning to follow Jesus. Well, one day I was on the stacks and I was so excited about doing things for, for Jesus. Like we did plays on campus. We, it was great. But this isn't about doing this first reason for calling them. It's about being. He says, I called them that they might be with him. And this is so important. I, I, in my notes, I put it in bold, be with him. And I actually underlined it, be with him. Because sometimes it's easy to forget that the reason why he calls us is to be with him. Sometimes we, we skip the being with him to go to the doing with him or doing for him. But it's really being with him is where it starts. And in fact, the doing with him flows from the being with him. And if you're doing without being, then you're really not doing what you think you're doing. He says, I appointed you that they may be with him. And I remember being 20 or 21, and I was like, I read this verse, and I, I was like, I'm so glad I read it because at that moment I was caught up in doing, and, and it was like he was whispering, Donnell, I want you to be with me. I want you to be with me. It's like I drifted from being with him and I thought that the doing was the being, but they're not the same. You could do stuff with people and not really be with them. Some of you call that a job. If you're honest. He said, be with me. I was just thinking, man, Lord, I just got quiet. You know that moment when your soul just begins, something inside you shifts? Just, just the thought. You, you were moving, you were revving, and then all of a sudden you just kind of slow down. 
internally I was slowing down. Like being with him, it, you, you start to slow down. The world's moving at a clip, and you just start to slow down. You, 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 you catch your breath. And I don't mean, uh, how was the song we sing? It's his breath in our lungs. That's the breath I'm talking about. And it's like, yes, to be with him, then he's going to send them out to preach, and they're going to have authority to drive out demons. But the first thing was to be with him. And it doesn't say, be with me to send out, be with me to have authority. Be with me stands alone by itself. And this is this table of 12. I've called you to be with me. And it's a small group. We call our small groups life changers. That's just what we call them. And it's not because somebody at the table is changing your life that you can see with your eyes. It's because Jesus is at the table and he's changing all our lives. And this way of changing our lives is him loving us, him correcting us, him challenging us, him disciplining us, his rebuking us, his comforting us. And yes, he might do that through the people at the table, but it's still coming from him. But the the group is together. They're on this mountain together. And for the next three plus years, they're all together. And the table is portable. Sometimes they're on a mountain. Sometimes they're in a temple. Sometimes they're in Jerusalem. Sometimes they're in Nazareth. Sometimes they're in Capernaum. They're all over the place. It's a portable table. It's not like this table, although this is portable in some sense. You realize that our church, until recently, has been very portable. We actually uh, uh, hired a company called Portable Church. It's for churches like us that don't have their own facility. We do now, but we didn't. And so we've met in elementary schools. We've met from place to place. We met in the YMCA. We've met uh, at at a large church that was shared by six or seven churches on one weekend. And we had to get in and get out, which means you have to set your stuff up and then put it away. So we have these bins that are six feet plus tall, and we have 20 some of them, and we store all our kids' stuff, all of our microphones. Can we just stop and applaud all the people who've ever served while we were portable? (laughs) Can you just chat? Chat in the, uh, if, you were, if you were part of the church when we were setting up and breaking down and setting up and breaking down, would you just say, I was one? Just put, I was one, or put, I am one. We sell it. Let's clap for the people online who are watching, right? You get up early and you come in and you're sweating before service starts. Israel was like this in the Old Testament. When they left Egypt, they didn't have a permanent space. For uh, 40 years, they're wandering, setting up the tent, breaking it down. And that was a massive tent. They had to set up all this stuff. And so people were volunteering and serving. Thank God for all you who serve. You're serving the Lord. But it was all portable. And the reason why I mention this is because the table with God is portable. Every place we go, I think about my small group, we meet virtually on Friday mornings. But it's a portable table. Whether it's two of us, or six of us, or seven of us, however many it is, it's portable. We can meet virtually, we can meet physically. Sometimes we're in the hospital with one another. Sometimes we're riding bikes together. Sometimes we're doing all this thing. But the key is that Christ is being, we're all together with Him wherever we are. And because it's a portable table, he he works with us and moves us, and he moves us from place to place, sometimes from the place of despair to the place of delight. It's that portable. It's not just a physical place. It's what he does inside of us because we're together with him. When one of us in our small group is discouraged, the Holy Ghost, God, by his Son, begins to encourage the one who's discouraged. And he'll do it through those who are in the small group together because the one-on-one relationship you have with him is intensely personal, but he puts you in a group with others so that you could benefit from him being with us, him being together with us always. You can be in Bosnia and you're still in your small table group. 
doesn't matter where you go. It matters that you understand this is how his table works. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see you. We begin to experience him together. You remember the two men who were walking on the road? Could have been two men. It could have been Cleopas and his wife. We don't know for sure, but we know there were two walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus was with them. They said, we're not our hearts burning. And being in my small group is where my heart, the Lord, has set it on fire because of the table I've sat at with people. One thing they say. You know what else happens at your table? Someone shares their weakness. Someone shares their shortcoming, their pain. And when you hear it, something in you resonates like, wow, you struggle with that too? Yeah. And then someone will go, yeah, I, I, I do too. And next thing you know it, there's this communion that you all are having with the Lord because you find yourself struggling, but at the same time, you realize you're not struggling alone. How's it encouraging? How encouraging is it when you realize you're not struggling alone? Like you're not rejoicing that someone else is struggling. You're rejoicing that you're not struggling by yourself. And then you see Jesus at the table who says, watch how I struggle. And then when you see him struggling, it encourages you when you're weary to be strengthened by seeing him struggle because of the strength that he found in his father to endure certain things. You start learning from him. You start watching him. He says, you, you see him like Jesus talks to us about his life through the scriptures so that we can be encouraged by his life in ourselves to live. But walking that out with other people, man, it's so good. We are at the table with him in our portable small group. He's present with us, walking, sitting, standing. We hear his voice together. We understand his words together. Together we feel his heart. Together we know his will. We experience him together. We experience him and his love, his compassion, his correction, his rebuke, his mission. How many of you have ever been corrected in a small group and no one said anything to you directly? But you heard something, sure, like, ooh, I felt that. He started adjusting my thinking. He started adjusting my, my attitude. I don't mean that somebody in your small group pointed their finger at you and go, you know you're wrong. I'm saying, as you all were just together, the Holy Spirit touched you, but he did it in that moment. You should be grateful because that's you experiencing him personally when conviction comes on you. How many of you have been together with him in your small group and you felt your soul being healed? You felt your soul being restored? You felt him relieving your fears? How many have been in your small group together with him and you understood and received his command to love others, to preach to others, to pray for others that they might experience healing, freedom, faith? And this is what God does. I want to take a moment to pray. And um, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. Just for a moment. I can honestly say you know, we say the expression, I don't know where I would be without God. It's a phrase. We understand what it means. But if you think about it, you actually do know. And I'd be dead. I don't mean just necessarily physically dead. But I'd be so disconnected from God. I'd be so far from Him best word to describe my condition would be lost. Not only do I not, not only do I know, you know, where I would be without God. I know where I would be without him being together with him in my small group. I need those relationships. I need those people who I walk 
through life with. The table moments, those 60-minute moments in the week, those are scheduled moments. But when you really start to understand the table, you realize it's not just only showing up for that 60-minute moment. Some of you, 90 minutes. Some of you just go on, you just keep going. End your group and just say, you guys can leave now. And then if you want to keep talking, keep doing that, right? Don't hold people hostage. But when you start doing life, being together with him, like the 12 of Jesus, he's still at the table with us. But it's portable. So we have these moments where we're sitting at the table, but these moments continue even when we're not at the physical table because we start to do life together beyond the table. It's kind of like Sundays. You know, I've had someone tell me, you know, for years and years I came on Sunday and I loved being here, but as soon as it's over, I'm the first one up and first one out the door, never connected with anybody. And I know that people do that. But there's something that happens also when you kind of, you, 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 you've got into the water, but now you just kind of swim and wade over to other people in the pool and you realize the connections that God intended. Some of those relationships are felt. Some of those relationships are forged. I, I feel I need to say this. In your small group, some of your relationships are going to be felt, like there's an immediate connection. But some of those relationships are not felt at all. So you think, I don't belong here. I, I want to offer something to you that I learned, that some of the relationships that God put me in were felt, but some of them were forged. I didn't feel it, and I didn't want it, but I needed it, but I didn't know I needed it, but God put me there, and then a year or two later, I realized that's why I'm in a relationship with this person who I didn't feel a connection to, but God forged something. Some of the, some of the deepest things that God will do in your life will be through relationships that you actually don't desire to have. You know, we sometimes think of the 12 like what they became and we forget how they started. Nobody wanted Matthew in that group of 12. Nobody wanted the guy who was extorting people in that group. Some of those relationships were felt, but some of them were forged. How, do, how can you forge a relationship that's not felt? It's because he's at the table. That's the only way it works. He's at the table. And you won't ever forge relationships that are not felt unless your eyes are opened to the reality of the one who's at the table. So I have friendships with people that I would not have chosen. But I have to go back to the fact that I didn't choose God. He chose me. And he chose him and he chose her, and he chose him, and he chose her, and he chose him, and he's the only one in the group perfect, and even if the two of us don't get along, he chose us to be with him, and being with him means we got to be with each other. Go ahead, chat something in the, in the chat. Like, come on. And that tension is the process of letting Christ be formed in you more and more so that relationships can be forged with others that you don't even feel. Otherwise, you're just a click. Lord, thank you for this intensely personal and portable table. You choose us to be with you. That's the first thing. I pray that everybody listening, everyone watching, that you'd open the eyes of our heart so that we could see you at the table. Maybe we need to put an empty chair at the table visually when our group meets. If there's seven of us, put up, pull up an eighth chair and leave it empty and go, He's at that. That's his seat. So there's a conscious awareness that we're not just meeting, but we're with the life changer who's changing our lives. And then we pull up another empty chair 
for the person who doesn't know him at all, who we're going to invite to be there. And then this group's going to multiply. Lord, thank you for inviting us to the table. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Donnell.